This will be epic. SpaceX's gateway to Mars may double in size. How is that possible? The former NASA administrator wants to get rid of Starship. Can it be used for Artemis Mars missions? Impulse Space announces a space tug for Falcon 9. It's a game changer. And Japan attempts to land on the moon. But did it crash? My name is TJ. Welcome to What About It? And let's get right into it. Starship updates. Welcome back to Fog Base. Recently, the weather here hasn't been kind to us, and yet SpaceX's engineers are working day and night to get everything ready for the third launch of Starship. Let's take a closer look at their achievements. Despite the quick test campaign of the third orbital Starship, including two static fires of the ship and 33 engine static fire of the booster, the prototypes are still undergoing final preparations at the production site. Still, they might actually reach orbit as early as February. That is assuming that other factors won't slow down the preparations for IFT-3. There's still a considerable amount of work to be left at the launch site before anything is ready for liftoff. For example, at the orbital launch integration tower, the welders are continuing to repair the mount's legs. As you may remember, the launch table developed cracks following the liftoff of the second Starship, hinting at what might become routine maintenance after each launch. A clear indicator that this phase is nearing completion will be a fresh coat of paint visible on the launch mount. However, the launch deck itself also requires extensive work. It's currently pretty rusty, and with the presence of scaffolding, it's clear that it's nowhere near close to being launch ready. Moving to the tower's base, an interesting develop has caught our attention. Initially, mysterious markings appeared on the concrete part of the tower. The purpose of these markings were unclear at first. That was until workers began installing thick metal sheets in these spots. These sheets are designed to protect the tower from the blast and the heat of Super Heavy's 33 engines. It's actually surprising that this additional shielding is only being added now. Perhaps it's just to protect it in case of a mishap. Moving up the tower, we see the ship quick disconnect arm. It's a critical component of stage zero that allows delivery of power and propellant to Starship's upper stages. This part, however, seems to have taken significant beating during the previous launch, as two months later, it's still encased in scaffolding. Interestingly, the Mechazilla arm, also known as chopsticks, appears to be the only element on the OLIT ready for rapid reusability. Other than some light work, it's just been waiting for the chance to lift another prototype. While the OLIT currently doesn't seem to be optimized for rapid reusability, current modifications could make the turnaround time of a week or two more feasible. What are your thoughts on this? Will the first tower be modified for rapid reuse, or is it more likely that the second tower will be the one for launching starships frequently? Let me know in the comments below. Now let's move back a bit to the orbital tank farm, which has been a major area of work for engineers in recent weeks. Efforts are ongoing to connect the horizontal tanks to the existing infrastructure. Meanwhile, there has been an interesting plot twist regarding the vertical tanks. Some time ago, we saw the removal of two GSE shells and one GSE tank. Initially, we thought that the vertical tank farm would be entirely phased out soon due to significant damage. However, recently activities suggest otherwise. Equipment used for tank removal was recently taken away, and soon after, tall metal beams were transported to the launch site. These beams were then welded together to one of the liquid nitrogen shell tanks. Then a similar process started for the water tank. It now looks like all vertical tanks will be outfitted with these supports. The question on everyone's mind is why reinforcements for the tank shells is only being implemented now. If such a solution existed, why did they do it immediately after the first Starship launch? While we might never get a definitive answer, it seems to indicate that the new horizontal tanks won't be fully operational in time for the third launch. Shifting focus to another area of the launch site, last week we speculated about the new construction near the water delivery system for the flame deflector. Now there are some intriguing updates regarding the mysterious structure. Firstly, it's now clear that it will not be a foundation for another tank, so any hopes of a star-based water tower may be set aside for the time being. Although I'm very disappointed about that, it will happen one day, I swear. I don't know how many years I've been waiting for a water tower there. Instead, what we're seeing is the creation of some form of a building, as evidenced by the recent pouring of concrete into the structure. However, it appears not everything went as planned. Not long after the concrete was poured on, our photographer John witnessed what looked like a framework blowout. It seems there was a flaw in the casing, leading to one of the walls giving way under the pressure, spilling concrete everywhere. Ugh, that's not good. The aftermath clearly shows that something went terribly wrong. The damaged section will likely need to be demolished and reconstructed. Hopefully at least a part of it can still be reused. The intended purpose of this building remains a mystery, however. Word around the block is that it could be a permanent restroom for SpaceX employees, but 
That could be an unusual placement for a restroom, right? What do you think this building could be used for? Do you have any other different ideas? Share your thoughts in the comments. Surveying the launch site, it's clear that there's still no visible progress on the second launch tower. However, recent documents suggest a possible location for it. Check it out. A recent proposal of land exchange between SpaceX and the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has provided some clues. These maps caused a lot of confusion, so let me explain. SpaceX currently owns approximately 477 acres or around two square kilometers of land adjacent to the Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge near Port Isabel. This area is not particularly useful for SpaceX operations. The other map shows Boca Chica State Park, marked in orange, encompassing most of the wetlands in the region. Then there's green areas, totaling about 43 areas of roughly 175,000 square meters. What SpaceX wants to do is swap their 477-acre property for the 43-acre area located at Starbase. What this might initially seem like is an uneven trade given the difference in land size. The key here is location. SpaceX can't erect a launch tower near Port Isabel, so unless they build a factory there, that land is useless for them. At Starbase, however, three areas within the exchange land are particularly important for SpaceX. Two of these parcels are located close to SpaceX's tracking station and residential area. Acquiring this land could enable SpaceX to build even more housing, allowing the city of Starbase to expand. But the most important aspect of this proposed exchange is the piece of land right next to the current launch site. If SpaceX could merge this with the area of wetlands, which has to be approved by the Army Corps of Engineers, the launch site could potentially be doubled in size. Not only would that make constructing the second OLIT easier, but it would allow them to include things like additional test stands dedicated for boosters. The location of the land also implies that the new tank farm will replace the suborbital farm, and the tower will be located at the newly acquired terrain. The meeting to decide this land exchange will be scheduled for January 25th, so fingers crossed that they'll get this plan through. Expanding Starbase is crucial for SpaceX to increase their launch cadence, a critical step towards the ambitious goal of colonizing Mars. While the current V-1 ships might not be the best vehicle for Martian missions, Elon Musk's recently revealed V-3 could be a big step toward developing a spacecraft that can deliver parts for future Artemis missions. Though initially focused on the moon, Artemis is ultimately intended to reach Mars. A hearing was held on January 17th regarding the recent program delays, which we covered in a previous episode. For context, NASA has postponed Artemis 2 to September 2024 and Artemis 3, the first crewed mission moon landing since Apollo, to September 2026. During the hearing, while the House Committee expressed disappointment over another delay, everyone agreed that we should continue funding the program without any major changes. Everyone except the former NASA Administrator Michael Griffin. He criticized the Artemis program's complexity and the risk it poses to future crew members. Griffin advocated for against using commercial launch services for lunar missions, proposing instead a complete program reboot without the involvement of companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. Here we go again. He proposed an alternative mission plan utilizing two Block 2 SLS rockets to carry yet-to-be-developed lunar lander and Orion capsule, aiming for a seven-day lunar stay. This proposal looks like an Apollo mission, but unnecessarily more complex. It also shares similarities with the Constellation program, which coincidentally Griffin strongly supported. Unsurprisingly, this suggestion received a lukewarm response at the hearing, with no questions raised about Griffin's proposal, new old plan. Fortunately, Starship is here to stay. Without it or reusable vehicles in general, it would transform Artemis into a modern version of the Apollo program, where the goal was to visit the moon, not to make it a second home. The venture to Mars will present an even greater challenge, and recent talks have highlighted how poorly we are actually prepared for the humanity-changing achievement. Ken Kirkland on X recently ignited debate on the feasibility of the current Mars mission plans by releasing this outstanding infographic. You should definitely check out his profile for more interesting content. The graphic illustrates that the current Mars mission architecture relies heavily on the SLS Block 2. In this scenario, an astounding 16 SLS launches would be required to prepare for the single Mars landing. Yes, 16 SLS launches, plus multiple commercial missions to refuel the deep space transport vehicle that will take us to Mars. Under the best circumstances, this mission would kick off in 2032 and span eight years with the goal of sending two astronauts to Mars for a 30-day stay. While achieving this would be historic, the sheer scale of investment and the probability of delays make this plan seem impractical or even insane. Billions upon billions of dollars and probably over a decade to send just two people to Mars. The obvious alternative and one that could make the mission more reasonable is to replace SLS rockets with Starship. 
Such a switch would be a huge challenge, especially considering the need to refuel each ship for the journey to cislunar space. However, the key advantage with Starship is the potential for more frequent launches and naturally the lower price of the mission. Rather than two launches per year, the entire operation could be condensed into a single Mars transfer window, reducing the mission timeline to two or three years, most of which would be the actual time traveling to and from Mars. NASA is expected to present an updated Moon to Mars plan soon, so fingers crossed that it will include more Starship. If we truly plan to reach Mars before 2040, we should have a solid plan by now to start developing all this technology needed to achieve that. What are your thoughts on this? Is a Mars mission relying mainly on SLS even possible, or could switching to Starship be a game changer? Now before we continue with the news, I need to ask you for some quick help. YouTube may have unsubscribed you from our channel without your knowledge. This has happened to thousands of Y viewers, and it can happen to you. Please double check that you've hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss our updates. And while checking, hit that like button and consider becoming a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, now including orbital, aerial, and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. One of the photos is this incredibly high resolution satellite image from SkyFi showing Kennedy Space Center last week. We can see some really cool details that will break down in our next episode. And no matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access. You decide what you want to give. Check out our new website, as well as launch previews, road closures, and the latest weather report, and our multi-stream viewer, whataboutit.space. The link to our Patreon and the new website is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who have fulfilled the dreams of our team. We can't thank you enough, and as Felix would say, you rock. Now, going back to the news, we may have something that may disturb the entire launch market in the not-so-distant future. Check this out. We live in a world where the international launch market tends to focus on low Earth orbit. LEO is typically defined as an orbit with an apogee, the point farthest from the Earth, below 2,000 kilometers or 12,400 miles. This is the domain of rockets like SpaceX's Falcon 9, Rocket Lab's Electron, or ULA's new Vulcan Centaur rocket, which routinely deploy payloads. For example, SpaceX's Starlink satellites into orbits, ranging from 340 to 560 kilometers or 210 to 350 miles. However, once every few launches, we see missions targeting what's known as high energy orbits. These orbits, with apogees extending tens of thousands of kilometers into space, are typically aiming for geostationary orbit in higher reaching Lagrange points the moon, or even other planets. GEO in particular is a high energy orbit where a rocket like Falcon 9 meets its limitations in terms of payload capacity. For missions aiming to reach GEO, for example, to deploy a communication satellite that will provide television signal for half of the globe, there are typically two options. Option number one is to utilize heavier lift rockets like the Falcon Heavy or the maxed out Vulcan Centaur. While exact capacities are unknown, it's speculated that an expendable Falcon Heavy can send over 8,000 kilograms or 17,500 pounds to GEO. With Vulcan Centaur, the official numbers are pointing to around 6,500 kilograms or 14,300 pounds. The downside is the cost. A full Falcon Heavy launch can exceed $150 million, with Vulcan reaching possibly up to 200 million. The alternative is to launch the payload into what's known as a geostationary transfer orbit. This elliptical orbit has an apogee close to geo, but a perigee, the point closest to Earth, only a few hundred kilometers up. A Falcon 9 can easily handle such a launch. However, this launch requires the satellite to have its own propulsion system to execute the necessary burns to raise its perigee. This method is more cost effective, but it demands a heavier satellite and typically takes several months to reach the final orbit. In the end, you always have to choose either spend a significant sum to get direct geo insertion via a heavy lift rocket or design your satellite for a GTO launch, which is cheaper but involves a longer journey to the final orbit, losing potential revenue. Not to mention that when choosing GTO, your satellite has has to go through all the tougher parts of the Van Allen belt multiple times, which also has to be considered. What if there was a solution that combined the best of both worlds? A way to directly launch a satellite into GEO using an economical, reusable rocket like Falcon 9. Meet Helios, a space tug developed by Impulse Space. This interesting vehicle essentially acts as a third stage that fits within the fairing of the existing rocket. Its design centers around the Deneb engine, capable of generating 15,000 pounds of thrust, comparable to performance of the legendary Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10A. A key difference, however, is Helios's use of liquid oxygen and liquid methane, which is the fuel choice of most rockets nowadays. Using Methalox enables Helios to be paired with various rockets, including Terran 
R, Vulcan Centaur, and even New Glenn. Okay, but what about Falcon 9? Doesn't it use RP-1? Yes, it does. And here's the intriguing part. Launch Complex 39A has been modified for fueling Nova C. It's a moon laner that uses LOX and methane due to the boil off of tanks that has to be filled just before launch. Coincidentally or not, thanks to this change, Helios can be compatible with Falcon 9. Okay, but can this really become a true game changer in space exploration? Actually, with Helios, a wide range of rockets can be effectively transformed into vehicles optimized for high energy orbits. Let's stick with Falcon 9. Adding a tug significantly enhances its capabilities. Typically unable to send payloads directly to Geo, adding Helios allows it to deliver up to 4,000 kilograms or 8,800 pounds directly into geostationary orbit. That's a huge difference. Helios's potential extends even further. Theoretically, it can allow for sending 6,000 kilograms or 13,200 pounds to a translunar injection orbit and 4,500 kilograms or 10,000 pounds into interplanetary space. This means it offers roughly two thirds of the Falcon Heavy's capability at half the cost and with full reusability. Do you see now how this can be a game changer? In the best case scenario, Helios could enable SpaceX to convert every mission into a return to launch site landing, a potentially allowing SpaceX to exceed 200 launches per year. Currently, it's just wishful thinking, but it's technically possible. TJ, that sounds too good to be true. Simply another scam company, right? Uh, no. To understand the potential of Impulse Space and its Helios tug, we have to take a look at the person behind the company. It's none other than Tom Muller himself. Muller led the design team for all versions of the Merlin engine, one of, if not the most reliable engine in the world. He was also instrumental in developing the Draco and Super Draco engines used in the Dragon capsule. Trust me, this man, is a living legend. With Helios, Muller aims to revolutionize high energy orbit launches in the same way SpaceX transformed LEO missions. The debut launch of Helios is slated for 2026 and I can't wait to see it. This is gonna be epic. Staying on the topic of missions to places away from Earth, let's talk about SLIM, or Smart Lander for Investigating Moon. Developed by the Japanese Space Agency, SLIM was designed as a lunar lander with a primary objective of achieving a successful soft landing, a task that is proven challenging for several recent missions. However, SLIM's approach to landing was quite unconventional. Instead of the typical slow descent using engines, SLIM was engineered to hover about three meters above the lunar surface then cut its engines, deploying its payloads, and use thrusters to rotate before intentionally falling into the moon. The idea was that its crushable feet would absorb the impact. So, how did it go? Eh, pretty sort of great. Slim did manage a touchdown and remained in one piece, but the telemetry data from the live stream suggests that it either impacted the moon immediately after the hover phase, or didn't slow down enough and rolled over. The current state of the spacecraft appears to be upside down, which poses a problem for its solar panels as they are unable to face the sun. On the bright side, both the lander and its two deployable payloads were operational until their batteries depleted, marking Japan as the fifth nation to achieve a successful lunar landing. However, the lack of solar panels means the lander might have already shut down by the time you watch this video. There is a glimmer of hope that as the sun's angle changes, SLIM might reactivate. We'll keep you updated on any developments. And that's it for today. Remember to hit that like button. Please subscribe for more awesome content from us. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us all immensely. Check out our epic shirts on your favorite space nerd store. Link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this next video to continue your journey. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you again in the next episode. The Venture to Mars will prevent... The Deneb engine. Many expressed disappointment. This is the... Ah!